Okay, presenting our next speaker. Do you want presenter view? Sorry? Do you want presenter view? Oh, okay. sure. Perfect. This is Kay Hello Madigan. Hi, uh, thanks very much. So uh the title of the of the talk in the in the in the program is a more uh, kind of subtle version of this, but the, the main point that we're trying to make is that we might as well get straight to the point is that we're making the claim that apes uh are rational agents and uh, human children are what you might call primarily socially rational or originally socially rational. So um, you're all familiar with this big claim that Aristotle made that the big distinctive marker of humans is that they are uh, they have reasoning. Um, and he was mostly a biologist. He's famous now for all the philosophy, but actually at the time he was the big biologist. And uh, trying to distinguish different species, he thought the distinguishing marker of humans was that they were rational um there's a lot of ways of thinking about what what counts what makes something rational um a way that is tempting but when you think it through doesn't really make any sense is to think well if they're not irrational right then they're rational but that doesn't make sense right because chairs and tables are not irrational but they're not rational agents right um so uh the 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 more substantial notion of rationality might be that, uh, which he seems to have certainly had in mind, and that, uh, let's say, uh, Dan Sperber's put a lot of work into trying to tease out, is the idea that um, you know the reasons for your actions, you're aware of them, you're keeping track of the reasons for your actions and for your beliefs, and you can keep them in mind, you can reevaluate them if you think I've done something for a silly reason, you can reevaluate it and maybe change your, your course of action. So let's say that to be a rational agent or to reason is to be able to keep track of the reasons you have for your actions. Um, doing this is a kind of a metacognition. So there's a lot of work on metacognitive monitoring. And so studies that might tap into this will, will probably build on the, the kinds of work that has been done on metacognitive monitoring, where metacognitive monitoring is being able to keep track of, let's say, what you know or what you want. Um, it's uh, a lot of studies looking at uncertainty, whether I know that I'm uncertain about a certain thing. Um, but if you're, if you're, if you're monitoring uh, what you could call rational monitoring, um, we, we might say that you're, you're monitoring not just your beliefs and your desires, but you're monitoring the reasons for your beliefs and desires and your actions. So this is what we try to, uh, try to focus in on. Classic metacognitive tasks, uh, metacognition tasks include this opt-out uh, paradigm where you have uh, an agent, uh, a rat, in this case, in the original study of uh, Crystal and Foot, has here's a short tone or a long tone and learns that if he clicks the left lever he gets a reward if it's a short tone uh, if it's a long tone he has to click the right lever to get the reward but there are some tones that are in between so like a short tone i mean beep a long tone beep and then a short term might be beep and and he can't tell the difference and he has the option of choosing a lesser reward by pressing a third lever um and the and if 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 uh, he opts out of the task, he gets a lesser reward. If he gets the wrong answer, he gets either uh, he gets no reward. Right. So there's a, a good strategy is for for the rat is to uh, press the third lever if he doesn't know the answer. Now this is interpreted as the rat keeping track of what he knows. So you can say, well, I don't know the answer, so I'll pick the third lever. But there are some problems with the interpretation. Like for example, the third lever might just learn be learned to correspond to medium length tones. <laughs> right. So that's the problem. Great great approach, but there are uh, problems, uh, but it's supposed to reveal a recognition of your own uncertainty or the ability to keep track of when you're uncertain. Um, a approach that doesn't have this problem, you could say, is uh, this uh, information seeking paradigm, where uh, in this study here, originally done with apes, um, Joseph Call and Melinda Carpenter gave apes uh, two tubes. The experimenter stands on one side of the tubes and uh, takes a grape, does a magic trick, and puts the grape into one of the tubes. The ape doesn't know which one, and the very simple reaction of the ape is to uh, look inside the tubes before making a decision. Right? And the interpretation is, well, the ape, in order to know that he needs the additional information he must know that he doesn't know where the grape is and specifically because this is what you could call targeted information seeking as opposed to just searching randomly around the apparatus for a grape 
that suggests that the ape knows what the ape doesn't know. So it's an indication not just that the ape is uncertain, but that the ape knows specifically what information he's lacking. So this is a good indication that the ape knows what they don't know. So we've got these kinds of work in the background, but now we're looking for a test that will show that the ape can keep track of their own reasons. And so we, we came up with what we call a rationality task. Um, and the, 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 the basic model is that you elicit a decision from an agent, you get somebody to make a choice about something because of giving them a good reason for making it. For example, you got two boxes, one appears to have a grape in it and the other one doesn't. So they pick the box with the grape in it. What's the reason for picking it? They can see the grape, right? And then you give them new evidence that undermines the decision that they've already made. And now if you think about this, what you might do as a human would say, when you see the new evidence, you might say, but I thought that the grape was on the left, right? So it's this moment in our regular thinking that we're trying to get at, this moment where you go, but wait a minute, I thought that. And now you're thinking about your prior reason for your action. And so that's the, 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 the point that we're trying to get at. So we give them new evidence that contradicts the prior evidence, and we test to see if they go and look back at uh, the original size of where they thought the grape was. And this is their evidence for them having in mind their original reason for their prior choice and double checking it. So here's the setup. Um, apes see two boxes, one with a, a big grape and one with a small grape. And the boxes are pushed towards the ape and the ape chooses in this case, the box on the left, right? Because the, the grape looks bigger on the left. And then you pull the apparatus back and you turn the uh, boxes around and we've used magnifying glasses to change the apparent sizes of the grapes in the experimental condition. And now by magic, the grapes seems to have switched positions or now at least the one on the right looks bigger. And you present the ape with the apparatus again and they can either uh, just repeat their choice or they can just switch their choice or they can wait and they can climb up a little bit, look down into the apparatus from the top before making a decision and make a choice. So it seems like the only reason they would have for climbing up and looking down from the top before making the decision is because they're thinking, but I thought that the grape was on the left, right? So, so this double checking at this point uh, seems to depend on the ape having in mind their prior representation for their original decision. And so they're keeping track of the reason they had for making the decision. And this would indicate that they are actually keeping track of the reasons they have for their actions. So here is uh, the condition where the two views agree, right? So there's no contradiction. Oops. There we go. So the grapes are presented and then put into the boxes. Apparatus, the screen is removed and Kara is presented with the boxes. She picks the one on her right and then they're rotated. They look the same and she repeats her choice. She doesn't stand up or anything. Right? And then uh, in the condition where the, they conflict, oops. There we are. Okay. So now the grapes go into the boxes, a big grape and a small grape. And now the big grape appears to be on her left, our right. And she's going to pick that box. She picks the box on her left. And then they're rotated. Oh, wait. Okay. So she double checks. And then says, and then and then repeats the choice, right? So she says, "Hang on, I thought, right? Let's say," uh, and she gets more information, double checks, and then makes her final decision. Okay, so what's what's really interesting here is that, well, first, what's really interesting is that the apes had no problem with this, and actually, we originally designed this as a study where we expected that this would show that you know humans have this ability to keep track of their reasons, and apes don't. But after multiple versions and controls, the apes clearly have a much easier time with this than three-year-old children. So the three-year-olds could not keep track of a blatant contradiction in, right in front of them, couldn't keep track of the evidence that they had beforehand, whereas the apes had no problem with this. And the five-year-olds were 
not not different from the apes. Um, okay, so interim conclusion: apes, but not three-year-olds, uh, revisit prior evidence when they're contradicted, or they keep they're keeping track of the reasons for for their decisions. They're able to keep track of the reasons for this, for their decisions. Which and the reason Aristotle's still in the in the picture is because you know this was the big marker that's supposed to distinguish humans from from uh, non-humans. Okay, here is uh, a second study. So this time, what we did was we we bring uh, two uh, participants together, two apes or two children. And now what happens is um, the reward is put into one of the two boxes in full view of both the participants. And then the boxes are rotated so that the the guy in the distance can see inside the boxes, right? So he gets some extra evidence. I'm gonna rotate the boxes. And then when the boxes are rotated to the surprise of the guy in the distance, uh, the grape looks like it's in the other box, right? From the one that was where it was just deposited. So the box is pushed over to the other guy. He makes a choice. The, his choice now contradicts what the first guy saw, where, where the first guy saw the grape go. And then the, the, the box is pushed back to the first guy, and he's he, this is the target, right? Uh, who now can do the same thing as in the first study. He can either just repeat his choice, or he can stand up and take a look before uh, making a final decision. And so we can see what, what's, what's happening here. Let's see. So the ball is going to go into the the box closer to the experimenter, and it okay. And you'll notice that the the okay. So the the, the other child picks what the first child expects. That's to say, the box that they all just saw the marble deposited in. So the marble is deposited, and it goes. Uh, other child picks exactly what the first child expects, same box. And now the other child nearly takes a look inside the boxes, which he can do by crouching down and looking through the tubes that are sticking out. He nearly does, but he doesn't bother, right? And he goes ahead and he makes his choice. Yeah, okay, I have no reason to, to be uncertain here. Okay. And then... Oops, and now when there is a contradiction, so the ball goes into the box closer to us. Okay. All right, so now the stooge child, you call it a stooge, he's not, he's not, he's not an actor, but uh, he's the non-target child makes now a surprising choice, right? So so the ball goes into that box. We can all see it right there. And now the other child picks the opposite box really saliently. Um, and now the target child is about to pick the box where he saw the marble go in. You can see his hand come up. But he says, hang on, wait, something's wrong here. And crouches down and takes a look. And then takes a look and decide the other one and sure enough yeah okay there it is <clears throat> so uh now here you get the reverse from the first study so in this case the apes do not double check in light of contradiction from their their peer even though they were really had no problem with this at all in the individual study when they're keeping track of their own prior evidence and their current evidence, they have no problem. But when it's their own prior evidence versus what he thinks, the apes just don't take this into consideration when they're trying to make their decision. Whereas the three-year-olds had no problem at this at this point. So the three-year-olds, it doesn't look like there's a big difference there, but that's actually highly uh, highly significant, um, were not significantly different from the five-year-olds, whereas the apes, uh, have there's no effect in the in the apes. Okay, so so now there's a, a second conclusion coming here, which is that apes are able to keep track of the reasons for their decisions, but children, unlike apes, 
are more sensitive to others' reasons or others' decisions than their own prior evidence. So the youngest children are able to keep track of a contradiction between themselves and a peer when they're unable to keep track of a contradiction between themselves and their prior evidence that they were just looking at a few seconds ago. So they're worse at keeping track of their own beliefs than they are at keeping track of contradictions between me and you. So it's really interesting way of seeing the primarily social nature of, of human reasoning. Okay, and so we see, <clears throat> if you look at the three-year-olds and then on the left and the apes on the right, you can just see that basically. The three-year-olds in the case where you're looking at physical evidence, don't distinguish the conditions uh, with a conflict of opinions, really strongly distinguish the conditions. And then the apes on the two columns on the right, when we're looking at physical evidence, strongly distinguish the conditions. We're looking at uh, conflict of opinions, don't distinguish the conditions. Um, so a really interesting objection that came up uh, through reviewers and through, through presentations of this work was, well, maybe the participants are just uncertain. So if you think about the, the first study where you've got the two boxes, and I first I see the box grape on the left, then I see the grape on the right. Maybe I just am no longer very certain, so I have a reason for looking for more information, but I'm not necessarily thinking of the prior evidence. So what we're saying, what we're trying to say is, oh, they're, they're keeping the prior evidence in mind um, and they have this in mind. They're thinking, but I thought, and that's what's motivating them to double check now at the second point. But the objection goes, well, maybe they're not thinking of their prior representation of the situation. They're just less certain now. They're just less confident. At some subpersonal level, there is a contradiction between the two pieces of evidence, but it's just reducing their certainty. It's not, they're not representing this explicitly. And so we thought, okay, that's a good objection. And so we thought, how do we uh, try to resolve that? And so it, it occurs to us that, well, if they weren't thinking of the prior evidence, then they shouldn't be specifically likely to check in the location where the grape appears to have been before, right? So you imagine you get the two boxes and you see a big grape here and a little grape here, but you're just not very confident. If you're going to double check something, you'll double check intuitively you would double check where the big grape appears to be right you think it's here you want to be sure so you look here as opposed to looking in what you appears now to be an empty box or a box with a, a, a reward you don't want so it'd be very weird if the apes were not thinking of their prior representation for them to be more likely to check in the location where the grape appeared to have been before when they do their double checking and so what we checked was when they do this double check where do they look first do they look first in the location where the grape appeared to be a few seconds ago, or do they look first in the location where it appears to be now? Um, and remarkably, they very significantly look more, they're more likely to look in the location where the grape appeared to have been before than in the location uh, uh, where the grape appears to be now. So that really seems to us like strong evidence that they must be representing their prior representation, their original reason for the decision they made just a few minutes ago, rather than only thinking of what's right in front of them right now. And so uh, final conclusion, apes and children seem to be able to keep track of the reasons for their decisions, uh, while young children are more sensitive to conflicts of opinion than conflicting physical evidence. And so human reasoning is uh, originally social, and this undermines, we, we might say a little bit, the, distinct, the distinction of between humans and other animals on, the, on this cutoff of, of, of reasoning. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Um, this is great. Can you pull up the slide with you with a between experiment comparison? Yeah. So the way that you describe it, right, is that the apes and the three-year-olds are significantly different within tasks, right? But what, what strikes me here is that both three-year-old and apes are inherently more questioning in the social condition, right? Because they double-check at around 70%. Everyone double-checks at around 70% in the second experiment right? But only around 30% in the first experiment. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I mean, and also like it goes in the same direction. So can you maybe elaborate a little bit on 
why you would think that is or what would be the reason for apes to double check if they were completely oblivious to other people's or other apes choices so the okay um well the there is double checking going on there is checking going on but the crucial thing is there isn't more checking if you look at the apes there isn't uh, in this conflict of opinions condition there isn't more double checking in the case where my partner contradicts me than when they say the same thing right that that, that that's that actually yeah, yeah, there's yeah, only I one understand. trial there's only one trial in the difference between those two boxes in fact no I, that i understand yeah. but i i'm wondering like if 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 um as an ape, I don't actually care, yeah. right, about the presence of the other ape because yeah. all I care about is my grape. Yeah. Then I would expect no main effect of experiment, right? Like I would expect my checking sure. rate overall to be the same across yeah. experiments. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Nice. So, um, so they they it, it's not correct. It's not right. And maybe I phrased that improperly to say that they don't pay attention to the other ape they do pay attention to the other ape and actually we did it because if they didn't pay attention at all that would maybe not be that interesting that they weren't distinguishing the, the conditions it would be like there was no other ape so you can't really compare the children and the apes right um so they do pay attention to what the other ape is doing and in a in a control condition that we did as a follow-up where i don't know where the grape is at all we call this an ignorance knowledge condition they will follow what the other ape says so and this is really interesting to how to tease apart these cases. So if I have no information and you're the other ape and you say it's in that box, I'll pick that box. But if you contradict me, um, it doesn't make a distinct. I can't keep track of that. So um, so the way we were thinking of this is like, uh, I have my belief box and uh, I have a representation of what's what's going on in your belief box. If my belief box is completely empty, I'll pay attention to your belief box. But once there's something in my belief box, I can't handle putting the two together and trying to think about, think about them at the same time, which is just harder work. You would imagine in general, that should be harder work, right? Remarkably, the children have an easier time with that than with the task that the apes excel at, which is thinking of their own prior beliefs and their own current beliefs at the same time. So, so that's generally the way we were thinking about it. Um, in terms of why they're peaking more overall in the in the social case, uh, we think that might just be that they're more en energized when there's two people playing the game. So they're they're, they're there's there's more peaking overall. Uh, yeah, as opposed to when they're on their own. Thanks. Okay, I'll leave that.